Welcome to the Sweet Arts of Fighting podcast. Today we have Paul Reed. Welcome, Paul. Thank you, mate. Thanks for having me on. All right, thanks for coming on. Relatively short notice too, so I appreciate that. But for people who are not familiar with you, Paul, do you want to maybe do a brief, uh, give a brief, brief background about yourself, and we'll go into a bunch of MMA S and C stuff. Sure. Well, I'll start with saying I'm nearly 56, so I won't do a full background because we'll be here all day. So um, <laughs> closer to 60 than I am 50 now, but. Um, Currently, I'm the owner, director, head of um, Vortex Combat Sports Performance. Uh, my partner and colleague in that is somebody that you may know well, um, Dr. Carl Evans. Um, I'm the, yeah, so um, a, a, like a brother to me, to be fair, but also a brilliant academic in the world of sports science, of course, as well. I have the Athlete Factory, uh, which is, people will know me from really, it's a high profile gym in the UK. We have a cafe. Uh, I have Cafe AF, separate business, but serving everything from hot food to the members to meal prep design for combat athletes, uh, especially that uh, fight week of the low carbohydrate, low sodium, low fiber design. It's food that athletes can enjoy, really. Um, I'm head of performance for English MMA. I've been for some time and vice president as well. So um, super passionate about development, development in the sport generally, uh, something hopefully we can touch on. Um, work closely with Mark Goddard, obviously one of the most well-known in the world um, officials. Dan Hardy as well, um, who works with us on that. So got some good guys around me. Um, I've had a long time in the sport, I guess, um, from um, being on the mat in judo from the age of eight, and here they am now. So I've been around fighters for a long time, on the mat for a long time. Um, no, um, no real fighting record to talk about of any notes not worth it but i've competed but at, you know at a lower level um at the moment i have an extensive athlete list from everything from ufc ufc athletes paddy molly quite well known jack shaw veronica hardy but then bellator pfl uh, octagon the cage warriors where i say the next superstars um luke riley nathan fletcher many more too many to mention but um also as head of performance with English MMA, we work with a lot of the youth athletes, amateur athletes, boxers, uh, GB judo athletes. So kind of a, a wide breadth of, um, of athletes, really, because um, that's what we're trying to do. And, and don't take for granted because in the UFC, they're any better than their approach from a young amateur as well, I would say. Uh, perfect. That was a perfect background given there. And I actually wanted to touch on you. Obviously, you mentioned you, you spend a lot of coaching over... Uh, I guess multiple levels there from youth MMA all the way through to professional UFC, etc. Do you want to maybe go into a little bit of your uh, strength conditioning philosophy there in terms of development? So guys that are coming in or even younger individuals that are coming into you for training and how that kind of progresses through to once they become, I'm not going to say professional because obviously there's a training age involved in how, how they may train outside of the sport, but just in terms of overall development, I know it's a very broad, long ranging question, but I'll, I'll leave yeah, that look, one to you. I think generally in the sport, it's a, it's very general athlete to athlete, sport to sport. Um, what I will say is that I've seen a lot of high level athletes have got zero in place. So no, no basics in place. What I'm saying is some kind of idea of how to run a strength and conditioning plan that isn't being sick on the floor daily in some kind of high intensity circuit and also don't know that yeah because you know <laughs> that, that shit goes yeah. on yeah it goes on with the with the youngsters um we're gonna first and foremost make sure that they are consistent and we create an environment for them to turn up to be consistent within because within without consistency then we're not going to really get any development either way we uh, load programs all onto an app for them that we encourage them to uh, study the videos um, read the cue points, you know, um, which is super important. So they kind of pre-educate themselves before they come in. And we do the basic movement patterns of lift, hinge, squat, um, lunge, you know, this kind of stuff, push, pull, because that's what we're teaching them fundamentally, but we're trying to teach them, you know, good technique, why we do it. Um, we're going to coach them correctly. Um, generally to have a plan and the plan will be all foundational lifting. Because some of the youth athletes we've got at the moment, and I want to make a point, James, they're exceptional at the moment. The talent pool in youth is exceptional. What I'm trying to break them out of 
is, and trust me, they do it, is this high intensity environment they put themselves in permanently thinking that's the way to do strength and conditioning. We're not doing conditioning with a, with a youth athlete, we're doing strength. We're going to teach them the foundation movements of strength. So that's the principles, but we also want them to enjoy it, build up, know what jumps are, plyometrics are, the basics, low level, some ballistics with like med balls, this kind of stuff. So because they enjoy that as a team, so we're still doing that. It's incredible to watch young athletes develop when you keep them consistent, do the basics of some low level plyometrics, some ballistics, um, lifting, all the foundation of lifting. They get better so quickly. And if we, if it's communication is everything, coaching practice is everything as well. As long as we explain that, give them the app that explains that as well, that they know what they're doing before they come. That's kind of the process. Of course, there's a limit of periodization with that as well. So, you know, we want to look at that, but ultimately to start with, we just want to teach them the right movement patterns. We want to teach them how to lift. We want to create a, a future for them that they enjoy coming into a gym. That's the most important thing for me. Awesome. Uh, you mentioned, obviously, most of us centered around teaching good habits around strength, training, plyometrics, lifting in general. And you mentioned that you don't really touch on conditioning with these youth guys. When does uh, When does the conditioning start to become or be incorporated in your programming for these athletes is it once they get higher up or older uh, yeah definitely older i think we'll see so if you split if you break mma down i'm going to talk specifically about mma you kind of got i say four then you've got youth then you've got amateur but actually amateur split into juniors and seniors uh, and then you have i say two levels of pro we can't just use professional you've got professional just pay them 250 pound, 500 pound, that don't have access perhaps to the top coaches. And then you've got the high level professional that maybe doesn't need to think for himself because he's working one-to-one -one with a coach. We try and progress them through to at least the junior and senior level before we start talking in the all the modalities of conditioning and how they should apply it. You'll find through their, their enjoyment for their sport that they're well conditioned from their sport. So, you know, they, they have a baseline for their sport that they're, reasonably well conditioned. I will say this, I think we also teach them about nutrition and the basics. I want them to optimize body composition. And the big thing for me, and I talk, I talk about this at every level, James, regardless of what, when we want to talk about conditioning, and even we talk about the more advanced athlete with internal, external load, I need to know that they're eating properly because it's a huge factor before we start thinking of getting the best out of an athlete in any way when they're listening to people and telling them to eat a thousand calories, low carbohydrates, you know, they've got disordered eating patterns showing at the age of 16. So we still talk to them and, and interact with them about what they should be eating before training and what they should be eating after, because ultimately, you know, it's the saying, the flogging the dead horse. If you don't eat well, it doesn't matter what I do. I'm probably, it's diminishing returns. I need to teach you that fuel is part of your performance. Yeah. Yeah. And especially in the yeah, weight class sports, man, like with you, I know my wife grew up uh, as an elite level weightlifter. So even through teenage years and stuff, like the weight class sports can, can wreak pretty big havoc on your body and things, especially when you're not given the guidance. Rich, you have a question here from the live chat. He's asking about, it would be brilliant to know your career path, how you started. I think we touched on that initially, but he's asking for any advice for young coaches would be appreciated too. I mean, very general question there, KP, but have you got any general advice for younger coaches there, Paul? I work and collaborate with great academics. I make a point because integrity is important up to me. I never went to university, James, and give some background to that. I've been uh, involved in senior management in business for 30 years. Last 15, owning the biggest prestige brand within this group for the uh, last 15 years, which I sold in December 2022. I actually did an MVQ of physical education, James, because there wasn't the things that you can get access to when I was a kid. And then after that, I took every kind of um, active IQ at the moment, which is level four in strength and conditioning, did all the personal training qualifications, traveled the world, studied the West Side Barbell way. I kind of tried to do as much as I can while running a big business. I will say this, is that the guys that I add value to perhaps that come into the gym and I mentor or work with or class them as my wingmen really that come from university is coaching practice and the art of communication is a skill you need to develop because I've had many with me that 
sports science doesn't always lead you to be a coach. Coach on the floor, the personal trainer, strength and conditioning coach. Not everybody goes to university for that. But if you do, and bear in mind in the UK, to be insured to be a coach on my gym floor, you still have to do a level three personal training certificate. So you're, you don't get insured just for your match. So now that's ticking the boxes. The real advice I'd give is you've got to experience people. Number one, you've got to work out making mistakes, develop your art of communication, find out what works with them. But your communication skills should make them ultimately come back to you. Keep them consistent. Um, enjoy the process. Educate them. If you're not available one week for holiday, they, they can do that program on their own because they're good enough to do that. But you, that's the number one for me. I think the biggest, and I'm outspoken about it, which is why have we lost the art of communication and coaching practice? I've got thousands of people I can quote that I've coached. I'm as good as I get as a coach. I'm still a student of the sport as far as what I do in performance, both in strength and conditioning and nutrition. And, you know, the guys will tell you, James, that I don't use the word science around me because that's not right, but I'm well-practiced, evidence-based. The guys around me respect me. It says everything with the, the level they're at. Um, but for me, if you want to be a coach, then coach because, you know, use as much as the academic learning or whatever you do, but you've got to get in front of people. And you and I know this, James, fighters as people are difficult. You're going to have to use, get used to that. What everything that you did in your education, this human being is going to stand in front of you and do some different shit that you're going to have to coach. Yeah. A hundred percent, man. I'm with you there. I mean, I went through, I started coaching. It was the only job I ever had. I started coaching at 13 or 14 years old when I was playing tennis back home so coaching kids that I've just coached ever since. And it's one of those things where you can't just, you see people like they did eight weeks and they lost weight and now they become an online coach or a coach or they've done some certification like for one week. And it's like, you can't, yeah, coaching is not a cert certification, coaching is not a certificate, coaching is not a degree. It's something that you have to do and you have to be shit at it initially. And you just have to develop, you have to learn on the job. It's almost like an apprenticeship. Um, and no number of certifications or anything will ever get you good at coaching versus actually being on the floor coaching people because, yeah, you're dealing with a lot of different people. I can tell you the things I learned from business and being the head of a major corporate of a high perceived, it was Mercedes-Benz with the brand and building my own business and being successful, was that coaching people was the most important thing I did for business success. But ultimately... I became a head of a UK council in education in the business. Didn't effectively have a business qualification, but I was good at coaching people on the practical fundamentals, how to them come into work and develop. I learned a lot from that, but I coached in football nearly all my life. I actually coached in motorsport as a, somebody that motocrossed and, and did quad bike racing competitively. I was the first to try and bring in some nutritional strategies and strength and conditioning around it because it was a tough sport. So I guess I've yeah. always coached. I've been coaching in the combat sport for, I'm writing programs now for intensively for over a decade, but I've done some bad stuff, James. Like some of the stuff's not good, but you've got to reflect and you learn and you work <laughs> with athletes and you get better, yeah. right? Yep. We've and I'm sure that. you're the same. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I can look back now and think of injuries that I've definitely caused in the past. <laughs> but we'll move, on, we'll move on from that. We'll go into... Yeah. Uh, you mentioned, obviously, you studied a lot of different things. You mentioned West Side as one of them. And it will be cool to dive into a little bit of your strength conditioning philosophy, now moving more towards, I guess, a more developed fighter, someone who's got some strength and conditioning background to them. So, look, the, the basics we talk about is I need athletes to understand why I'm doing what I'm doing. So we make sure that the language we use, and we can't get this to everyone, but the basics of the, whether we talk about mesocycle, macro, or, or microcycles, what I'm talking about, is all year round GPP, basically, and the approach to that. But the main thing is fight camp. And the fight camp, which is the basic approach we have, depending on a number of things. One is do the athletes stay in the gym all year round or they do they only do a fight camp because it becomes more intense. We don't need to do perhaps the higher volume, lower intensity at the start of camp with them athletes because they're already um, they've already done that work. We can start focusing on power generally, the speed. 
but we use almost a triphasic approach as well. I like that little eccentric loading at the start, but no, not, you know, we're talking about three to five. We switch into, and we're using more and more now isometrics. So overcoming uh, isometrics, uh, we're still, we're using a lot of now. We use a lot of yielding isometrics, and mainly for, for contrast work as well, because I feel it, it works great. We'll use isometrics where I think an athlete's quite beat up, if I'm honest as well. More joint friendly, we're still getting the right adaptation. And the back end of the camp, it's high intensity, lower volume, where we're developing strength, speed, speed, strength, rate of force development, you know, using accommodating resistance. That's kind of the basic philosophy we use. If we have the ideal 12 week camp, which we never very rarely do, by the way, um, obviously we switch from, I mean, there's a lot of chat about whether we use the classic linear periodization model. I'm kind of think you're doing more daily or weekly undulating, if I'm honest as well, because the subjectives of readiness load will play a part. And when we talk about their training load in their training diary from a technical perspective, I need to be close to the head coach because I want to understand that that day I've got my diary where I understand their technical load. It doesn't mean that they've just now traveled to another gym for sparring and sparring that day is now the RPE has gone through the roof and I need to adjust for that. So there's so many kind of things you have to consider outside of, I have a, we have a philosophy, a methodology, how we want to train an athlete. But what I'm finding more and more is that if you don't really understand the technical diary and you don't talk to the coach, and maybe you can influence RPE in the, in the technical window because they're coming to me beat up consistently, injured. Big one, James, underfueled, especially in camp in that kind of chronic phase where they've got signs of maybe low energy availability. We adapt to suits, I guess, but the basic principles of we're doing a bit of um, eccentric loading, we're doing using isometrics and we're, we're kind of doing that higher intensity almost. Um, we're, we're not putting any load in, we're kind of using ballistics, uh, rate of force development, banded exercises, that kind of stuff at the back end. I hope you're enjoying the chat so far. Before we get back to that, I just want to let you know that Sweet Science of Fighting is more than just a podcast. We have a full training app with strength conditioning programs for strikers, grapplers, and MMA athletes, so you don't have to think about what you're doing and you're getting access to the latest scientific methods to improve combat sports performance. We have programs specifically for judo, for jiu-jitsu, for wrestling, MMA, boxing, Muay Thai is coming soon. All these things are going to be in the training app. We also have a private community where some of the coaches that have been on the podcast are in there to help you with any training questions and any performance questions you have. For example, Andrew Usher and Casper DeVitt. We also have some online courses within the training app. They cover strength, conditioning, mental skills, and weight cutting. And finally, we now have Ryan Villalobos in the community, a second degree Jiu Jitsu black belt who is there to break down any of your grappling matches that you want seen to by a second eye. He's currently breaking down videos on a separate Sweet Science of Fighting YouTube channel, and he will break down your video within the community. So if you have a match or a role that you just recorded, you can upload that in there and Ryan will break that down for you. So what are you waiting for? Jump down in the description. You can check out the Sweet Science of Fighting Underground. Otherwise, enjoy the podcast. Let's dive a little deeper in as well. You mentioned triphasic. Some listeners might not be familiar with it. Do you want to maybe dive into a little bit, okay, what, what does a triphasic training block look like? And maybe just in that 12-week, perfect 12-week example, are you going like two weeks, two weeks, two weeks for those? Maybe three, because we're trying to work out, and this is the other thing about deload and trying to react to deload. We, we used to do, if I'm honest, a system that deload was set every week. I kind of become concerned that, we need to react to deload depending on the athlete score in there. So we call readiness scores because they all have to score it on their app. Uh, but it's normally three week blocks we look at, at the moment with the three weeks kind of um, deload or perhaps just reduce and load in this certain periods. So three weeks maybe eccentric loading, three weeks into isometric, three weeks into that concentric rate of force development focus. Gotcha. That makes sense. So how do the, how would those uh, days look in those blocks? Just as as a general example. So we do two days a week, full body, obviously. Um, they will switch, we'll switch on the type of lift. So from squat, squat to hinge, some, some kind of pattern of that. Um, we'll generally always interrupt with some contrast. So from death drop jumps to, to broad jumps to this kind of stuff as well. I will say we focus a lot 
in every session on plyometric development. Um, and also from a more intensive warm up because they're coming to us after sessions on a Wednesday, for example, they've done two hours. I don't want to start them lifting without, you know, extensive warm up, active, uh, active mobility, uh, probably more extensive plyometric than. Well, well, we're going to be looking at no more than three sixes, like at the start of camp, no more than 18 reps probably on the main lift, probably three to five seconds on the eccentric, that kind of stuff. Um, but that can change depending on the athlete you've been working all year, all year round, because I'm not going to put any eccentric loading on them, they don't need it. So it's a big part of like, triphasic plays a big part of what we do, but we don't always use it. We use it a lot in GPP all year round, if I'm honest as well. So we'll probably do four week blocks. Um, four big blocks of eccentric loading, probably a bit more. We use clusters, we use myotatic reps, we do all kinds of things within that as well. Um, we like we like things of uh, using unilateral work with kind of lifts like zerchers that I remember when I first started using zerchers a long time ago, James, a lot of people threw um, a lot of abuse at me to start with. It becomes now the lift of choice for a lot of people up now. <laughs> now. Now what's the most specific lift for combat sports? <laughs> now it is it, yeah people have thought i was i was mental or what are you doing what kind of lift is that right so um but look we use yep. the other thing we're responsible for we've got to limit injury we've got to know that they're good at lifting we don't use a lot of straight bar deadlifts because unless i'm really comfortable with their technique we've seen people hurt the backs the same as using sumo deadlift we do use it at times but i want them to be a bit more advanced we're using trap bars for deadlifts yeah, we do use some box squat, box squat if you want to kind of get that consistency of depth. But we use deep squat with the more advanced athletes. We'll switch from um, from bilateral to unilateral. That's kind of the way we make it up. And we will we will change on time under tension, the centric loading into more explosive work. And we're always doing contrast work into back end the camp. We even use French contrast. Mm-hmm. So I love that. Yeah, I, I, I was going to say I use uh, French contrast quite a bit as well, especially with the isometrics. You mentioned obviously uh, some of the overcoming isometrics used to do. I'd use that at the beginning of French contrast, especially during heavy training blocks, just because you, you don't have to have those heavy loads on your back or you know have to be lifting heavy loads. You can still produce high levels of force it, pretty quickly and then get into other stuff. Are there other things you do with those isometrics? Not really. We'll we'll alternate between overcoming and, and yielding, of course, and holding in position, which you know is pretty brutal. But you know we mm-hmm. do limit. Um, we're limiting joint pain generally, and that's what we're after. We use isometrics for people with with a knee tendonitis and things like that as well. Makes sense. We switch the lift. Um, it's been mm-hmm. great for us because we see a lot of knee tendonitis, and it's definitely changed the game for that. So. We used to have the kind yeah. of blocks. We're not afraid to switch into isometrics now if we feel the athlete's a bit beat up, they're struggling with a few injuries. It's a great way to, to get the same, an adaptation that, and actually it's great to contrast from as well. So, um, I, I'm, you know, I'd like to listen more. I've seen output of doing a bit of work on isometrics right now. Can't think of the guy in the podcast, but I've downloaded an isometric mm-hmm. kind of training course. I'm interested in getting more science on isometrics. At the moment, they work for us. And we can be doing isometrics and yielding for up to 15 seconds. We'll probably no mm-hmm. more, but we'll do as low as six when we're doing perhaps overcoming. Yeah, I'll link you up with them, Dustin Orinchuk after this as well, because he's he's done a bunch of stuff and isometric isometric training to a bunch of research there. He's been on the podcast recently again. But you, so you talked about you doing maybe three weeks, a perfect fight camp, may, depending on obviously everything else going on, but maybe a three-week uh, eccentric triphasic and then the isometric three weeks then you've got more of that concentric or rate of force development or say power style three week block how does that look within training are you still incorporating a lot of the stuff that you did previously in there yeah so we might use some potentiation with a heavy two for example or the heavy single mm-hmm. before we we um we start using their power work we use a lot of bands and chains at that stage as well for rate of force development Hmm. Um, we're going to do more extensive plyometrics in the um, in the um, contrast work as well. So we do use uh, we start using output on them again. So we get some information in the start of camp on jumps and uh, leaps and uh, their broad jumps and this kind of stuff, med ball throws, landmine throws. We get some information. We start testing them again at the back end of the camp. If I'm honest, the numbers 
a good, the competition it creates are better. Get a get a mm. team a team in for the testing day and start getting through landmines or doing speed um, speed bench or uh, doing squat uh, back squat jumps and stuff. It's incredible what you do when they're watching the teammates do it, how they've improved. I would say that. So I'm getting better adaptation, but that's kind of how it looks. We'll incorporate more jumps, top bar jumps, uh, banded top bars, uh, this kind of stuff, um, banded back squats, you know, so more speed. We're looking for speed. We're looking for, and we will VBT to mm-hmm. look at a certain, we want them over 0.7 or over one or whatever, you know, we're targeting as well. Um, we use search and banded searches, change for searches. So that's kind of what we do. I mean, we have multiple things uh, fit multiple people, but basically we're looking for speed. We're looking for very low. I mean, there'll be a time where I don't use any lifts, but we might do three, three twos or three ones for some potentiations or a heavy lift mm-hmm. and then start using maybe French contrast or some contrast from that. You mentioned you're, you're using more extensive style plyometrics during the training block. Why extensive over the more intensive variations? Um, mainly because I'm trying to develop skill. You'd be surprised how poor that some of the athletes are. And, and actually over time, um, we've got them a, be- a lot better from using extensive plyometric. It's very dependent on, do they have joint pain? Are they pretty injury free right now? Um, we'll use a lot of this at the start, but Things like lateral movement, lateral bounds, you know, um, broad jumps, um, general jumps, landmine throws, um, barbell throws, this kind of stuff we use a lot of. But plyometric generally is just speed off the floor, speed off the floor, movement off the floor, jumps and leaps and bounds, and then a lot of ballistics. So we do med ball combinations, rotational throws, single arm, double arm, this kind of stuff as well. So, um, I think we've built a decent pathway now that people understand why it's there and why they're doing it. If I'm honest, plyometrics have moved the needle on more athletes than I thought it would because they were so poor to start with. <laughs> I can imagine. I think it'd be interesting as well to dive into the, kind of like that final three weeks of that fight camp. I know, uh, I think it was Patty's last fight where they did, was it the UFC Embedded, where you guys are at the UFC PI and you... Uh, you took Patty through, I think it was, I think it must've been the final, almost like a final blowout. Do you want to maybe talk uh, what you were doing there and the why and kind of where that fit in the whole puzzle? Two things really. So we, we built this fight simulation. We're trying, we're trying to kind of mirror the energy systems you may see in five minute round. Yeah. And you, so I'm going to make it intense. Uh, you've got to make sure, though, it's important that you do this, that the athlete is fueled well enough in the week leading up to before you'd ever do that. And actually, it, even on the day before and that day, it's like, look, we're doing three five-minute rounds. You're not going to utilize uh, too heavy carbohydrates, but we still want to make sure that they're not an athlete that's been cutting carbohydrate three weeks out because that's pointless. There's a psychology to this, James, which is when we have a conversation with them and they do this at the end of the camp, it's for them to know that that's a tough session. And whatever I go through in my fight, potentially, I'm not going to go through anything harder than that. So when people look at, am I looking for physiological adaptation? There's, if they're fueled enough, there's no negatives to that session for three fives. However, a big part of combat sport and fight week is, is psychological. And over time, we did it a couple of times. And then before you know it, every single athlete within that gym, next year they're one of the most progressive, uh, successful gyms in the UK right now. It's got a killer mat from amateurs to obviously uh, Molly and Paddy at the top. But it become that they liked it because it become part of this about, I'm going to get pushed. I know when I walk through there, there's nothing I'm going to suffer with. And I think that's a big part of it, if I'm honest. Do I, do I think it adds a lot of value from a physiological point of view? No, I'm not too sure. But you know, is it good to do it with them? Yeah, they love it. They enjoy it. It feels like it's that where they tick off camp's done. Camp's done. They've kind of finished with that three fives, high effort, and like I'm ready to go. It's kind of you're ticking the box. Psychology is a big part of being ready for fight week. Uh, I, I've talked about similar things on, on the podcast and various videos as well. There's a huge impact of doing something like that and pushing and knowing and having that feeling 
that when you're actually in the fight that you get, you have that same feeling, but you know what you did previously and you know you can still push through that wall. Whereas if you haven't gone there and you go, you know, or maybe you have gone there, but you hadn't gone there when you'd already cut weight and things like that at this new body weight and you don't know exactly the outcome and you're able to at least relate the feelings. I mean, I think that's huge. I, I do think, and I would say this to anybody in SNC is that, and I said this before, is that you have to understand the nutrition. So if you're not going to understand it, have a great relationship, please, with the nutrition guy that they're working with. Yeah, because the best one in the world, a lot of things we talk about and what we do and how we design the fight camp and what the uh, program looks like is going to be super reliant on you knowing that they're fueling correctly. And the, and the most basic discussion I ever have with athletes is, um, one is, do you understand the energy availability? Have you set yourself a calorie target? Most important thing. Number two is, do you know how much carbohydrate you're eating? Let me tell you, less than 5% will tell me they know that. And if they know it, less than 3% have told me they're tracking it correctly. And, and I think you're talking about psychology of fight week. The other part of the psychology is that they know and have evidence that have been eating correctly as well, not just, not just their training system, not that just their a training diary from a technical perspective or what we do in S&C, you've got to know that they've been fueling correctly because, as I said before, diminishing returns and everything we talk about and everything we design and all our intentions and everything we're trying to do well will be stopped in its tracks if we can't get them to eat correctly. And with a long history of working in weight-making sport and putting people on the scales week in, week out and travelling the world, that's a pretty bleak place at the moment, mate, I can tell you. And, and I do think for us all to be as good as we want to be, if we don't deal with that, we're probably not worth getting into the major detail of what we're doing within the strength and conditioning camp or either monitoring the RPE or the technical uh, diary because it all stops and all fails if we don't know that they're eating correctly. Everyone stop eating a thousand calories of just canned tuna and lettuce like <laughs> six weeks out or something like that. <laughs> but, but, but that's real, mate. You know, I mean, people laugh at that, but I'm telling you, it's real. Yeah. That I've done. Yeah, I know. <laughs> and that, I've done so much work, mate, to talk to parents, kids, amateurs. I used to run my own promotion, James. It's worth saying this in my background. I run Shinobi MMA. I did that so I could try and create a platform I thought was safer and better for amateur athletes to develop on. As part of the as part of the weigh-in day over them seven years, I seen people collapse off scales, didn't make the weight, um, get taken to hospital. I've seen all kinds. When you get into the details of why that happened, and then I started questioning every athlete that came on the scale. It was scary. I know people haven't eaten for three days. Never mind uh, tuna and lettuce. You know, like running forty miles a week you know, uh, doing 0.2 litres per kilo of water, or doing all kinds of stuff. And that's been always a big part of, like, where they want to see development in the sport. Development in the sport to S&C and get them better at what they're doing needs to start making sure they're fueling correctly, right? Basic principle. I used to, I've got all the data from that. I've got the, the, the red crosses I give to gyms and athletes, the ambers, I thought not bad, and the greens that people were doing it properly. I only got two greens ever. <laughs> well, yeah. Bleak, bleak to put it that way. I mean, I mean that's why we have podcasts like this, right? To hopefully help some of the some of the fighters out there with with everything. But I want to I want to come back as well a little bit to the some of the strength conditioning side. All right, and you mentioned obviously you have Patty and Molly uh, under your wing at the moment. It'll be interesting to go into does their strength conditioning or how does their strength conditioning differ if it differs at all. Uh, well, it differed this camp for Molly because she went down a weight. However, uh, at the same time, it's probably the best she ever in, uh, interacted with us because she knew there was no tolerance. With Paddy, um, I've had a long, probably year and a half of dealing with injuries, so that changed the whole camp. So it's well known that he had the ankle surgery and it was poor. He's got extensive shoulder. Uh, he's got extensive tears in the level, uh, level of the shoulder, both sides, by the way. So, um, and he's got some, you know, issues that we need to rest that he wasn't able to press always through the camp for the Tony Ferguson fight. So 
things have changed, but the, the basics are the same. That what I would say is both of them are more in camp fighters, not all year round. Molly better to do her own S and C. Paddy is like a, just another fighter that if you left him alone, he's not going in the gym. He's not lifting. That's a big difference. So Paddy needs care, attention. He needs to listen at times. Um, is the approach is the approach different? Yes, yeah, approach is different for Molly. The approach is different for Molly is also me. Paddy's a phenomenal athlete from a con conditioning perspective. If he hadn't been in the gym for six weeks, you'll run a you'll run a great uh, half marathon tomorrow and get knocked a good time in. He's really good. Molly put more condition into this camp. She's always quite strong, but we knew she was stronger at flyweight. So at straw weight, we maybe focus more on uh, power, power and speed. I think that come out in the fight. That's the best she ever looked in, you know, in a round. She, um, she looked powerful. She hurt the girl, took her down with these, you know. So we changed her camp because lower, I guess, I mean, you say lower energy availability. Straw weight, she had 2,000 calories two days before she weighed in. So we know we could, you know, we could put the work into her. Um, but Paddy needs more work still on foundational strength. So maybe when we're getting back into that eccentric loading kind of phase, because he's out of camp a lot, his media duties, James, are off the chart. So if you want to kind of keep him in your, all year round, you can't keep him in the gym. He's traveling, he's going to America, he's invited to all the best restaurants in the world and paid to go there. Doesn't help me for getting him on weight. But, you know, it's going to change. When he gets <laughs> back, he's going back into the basic principles of a bit of centric loading strength, maybe higher rep, because we need to develop strength and we've got to get that first and foremost force production back with him before we start anything else. So Molly was in camp for quite a while for this. So we were able to focus more on power and speed and conditioning. So there is differences here. Next gen as a team are very forward thinking. They come in as a team. I don't know if you've ever seen. I can have 14 in at once. Could be UFC, Cage Warriors pros. Some of the footage you'll see are 14 athletes, including amateurs. We can have them work in five racks in pairs or threes, depending where they are in the phase of the program, where they are and what they require within fight camp, off camp, not being in the gym, that kind of stuff. But they come in as a team. They work as a team. We, they do listen, we set them in nutrition targets. And I think that's why the gym is, it has structure, the most fundamental principle of structure. Turn up, be consistent, yeah, do your work, eat properly. You're kind of going to move the needle a bit. And yeah, and then go back to that triphasic approach of eccentric loading, isometrics, some concentric focus, rate of force development and the camp. We do conditioning on a Sunday because they rest on a Saturday. So we can push them more. We don't do conditioning on a Wednesday because they come to us after two hours. So they're more strength focused, strength and power focused with rest on a Sunday. And then the rest of the week, their program, their runs, whether that's their recovery work, or whether that, that's the track work that they do. Gotcha. So how, does your, how is your conditioning philosophy there? We've touched a lot on the strength and power side. In terms of conditioning, uh, I mean, we can keep this get towards fight camp currently 12 weeks out how does that conditioning start and change throughout the uh throughout the fight camp again things to think about have they stayed in camp are they a well-conditioned athlete do they do the road work the biggest difference i'm going to say is between boxing and mma send an athlete uh mma athlete onto a zone two recovery run and tell them to maintain the heart rates around the 130 140s have to stop so we kind of start developing the 5K. And then we use some fartlek-based runs as well. So we kind of have a 5K, we'll use some fartlek work, and then we might use some red zone work as well. So we're trying to cover all the different modalities. On a Sunday, it's more about that strength and endurance, so sleds and ropes and this kind of stuff. Um, so that's generally how we focus it. If they get a training window, they're going to switch from 5Ks into fartleks. They might do the 400s. And start working on the 400 meter repeats and as you get further in we go 200s use some hill sprints always i'm always concerned about hamstring injuries and sprint work uh, into the 60s assault bike work is perfect for this as well so that's the kind of way we come into camp high intensities we get closer to camp but build the base to start with gotcha and then once you get into camp how does that how does that look then Depending, so this is the big thing for me about working with the coach and understanding their technical training diary about what is the best window for you to get some red line conditioning. 
because to be fair, the less is more approach is coming more into combat sport with coaches now. I think they are trying to work the RPE system of like, what does each technical uh, training session look like? If I want to get somebody in red line stuff, certainly uh, high intensity stuff, then I need to know I've got to fit it in the window when they're fresh and they're fueled. And but generally we're going to do some strength endurance conditioning, but we're going to do some like track work as well. I work with a great track coach. He brings them to the track. He also coaches them on, on general running practice as well. And believe it or not, they, they've improved so much. Probably induce, uh, reducing the injury risk as well. But um, but that's kind of, so 12 weeks, we're kind of doing a three-week block as they're doing their eccentric loading with more than that 5K work with their fart neck work. Then we're starting to switch then and we'll go into more than the 400. So or we do six, fours and twos in the block. So we're trying to look at that next. And then as we come into that kind of speed uh, speed phase, uh, high intensity, low volume phase, we're trying to get them into a lot of the um, short explosive work. So the 60 meters, the 40 meters, um, the short explosive hill sprints, that kind of stuff. Uh, and we're still using, you know, when they're fresh, we're still using, but shorter, we'll use some rounds. So we're going to kind of simulate what we did on that end session for Paddy, but we're going to put a few of them sessions in as well. Nice. Where do, the, where do you typically like these sessions to sit in a training room? Because I think a lot of people uh, have trouble kind of figuring out where they're going to fit this extra conditioning. Basic principles for me is we we want to understand readiness. How does the athlete feel, number one? If you're recording readiness scores under, in the twos and you're flat and you're sore and you've got no energy, then it's pointless. Because we do, we have readiness insights for every athlete, we can spot the days where we have the best days. But then it's about working with the coach to say where we got that lower RPE time or we can consider it to be a high day that we put some periodization of carbohydrates in. So we're fueling the athlete better and we'll class it as a high day if we can't find that training window. But I still want four to six hours, James, ideally, for rest period, for fueling period before they come and do that. There's nothing ideal about combat sport. It depends whether you've got a great relationship with this with the coach, first and foremost. I see a lot of people out there that have no relationship with an athlete's um, combat sport fighter with their technical coach. I'm not sure how that works. Like, I want a relationship with everybody. Head coach, physiotherapist, a nutritionist, if, if they've got one working with them, psychologist, I mean, you're part of a team. But I do think you've got to make sure that you understand the training window and well, that you understand the best time and you talk to the coach, especially if they're redlining them every single day. The one thing I will say is in boxing, in boxing especially, James, I can get them come to me and wonder why they're so flat and they've been, the coaches had them doing 20 hill sprints and a thousand press ups and the, you know, that kind of stuff goes on. Now I've built enough influence and respect to tell them to stop doing that because it's stopping my job. I'm going to say my job, by the way, it's important to say that Vortex Combat Sports Performance has Carl working with world-class boxers, has Connor Heaney, who's head of John Moore's University, strength and conditioning. Uh, we have Marcus Umman with us now with his um, master's degree. So, we all try and align generally in a training program, but you know, Carl and Connor will be they put a lot more testing. You've got gold standard testing at John Wells. Yeah, well, you know, we use output and we use Vald and we use Gym Aware as well. We put that in, but training philosophy is all the same. You've got to adapt to the athlete, you've got to have a conversation with the head coach, you've got to know where the training window is. If you want to get the best out of red line conditioning, then you need to make sure the fuel and you need to make sure what window you've got to do that in communication with the coach. Hey guys, it's me again. I just want to let you know that I also have Sweet Science of Fighting rash guards and shorts so you can represent Sweet Science of Fighting on the mats and within competition. We have the classic, just like the shirt I'm wearing, rash guard, Sweet Science of Fighting on the front and we have the logos on the sleeves and then X Marsh on the back. We also have that in a shorts variation. Same thing with the Sweet Science of Fighting writing on one leg and we have the logo on the other. But my personal favorite, this is my personal favorite by far. We have this in black and white, and it is the Tani Fag Protector Guardian version of the Sweet Science of Fighting with the logo on the back. This was designed by a Māori designer back in New Zealand. So a bit of my heritage on this jersey. It represents the acknowledgement of battle and war 
It also represents strength and stability and also has the New Zealand silver fern. But even if you're not a Kiwi, cop this. This is an awesome design. It is a custom made design. You will not find it anywhere else. So check that. That'll also be down in the description with a discount code. But back to the podcast. Uh, you touched on obviously taking readiness, readiness scores. So if anyone's not familiar, a uh, scale of one to five, typically it can be more, but you're basically judging things on soreness fatigue etc it's a subjective rating for if you're training and you kind of log in that score each morning but i wanted to ask you say during an important fight camp i don't know four or six weeks out whatever it is and you have guys maybe putting in ones and twos like red scores for fatigue and soreness uh, often i've found as well you know that can be in the morning but once they're warmed up and things and they've eaten everything they might feel better during that time or maybe there's times in that training period where sometimes the work has to be done regardless is, does that change at all for you as, as a low readiness score or something like, okay, we have to make changes or is it more of a uh, decision that you make based on a few other different factors? I think I have to beat uh, my drum or the team some a little bit here. We don't have a lot of people that are getting them low scores, um, if I'm honest. However, uh, if they do, the first conversation is why. So what did you do yesterday? Then I might find something out that wasn't part of the training program that I had for the technical diary. Also, um, I think we've got to understand when we talk about internal external loads as well, that lo loads is load of course as well. Now, you know, if you've got, we kind of think fighters are full time, even they're pro, they're not, they might have jobs, families, kids, yeah, um, financial issues, the whole demographic of combat sport in the UK is like, they could have some, you know, the wrong habits. It's real. They could have mental health issues. They've got all kinds of things going on. So you've got to recognize it, I think, as well. How do you deal with it? Listen, I sent a, talked to a head coach today. I sent a, a, he's a world champion in cage warriors, and I sent him out to the gym because his readiness score was poor. He felt poor all weekend. He'd come in. Experience is just coaching an athlete. can see he's off. I can see the way he lifted straight away. Um, you can see just doing some of the low level plyometrics and warm up. Um, sent him, stopped him, made him do some mobility work, some foam rolling, some stuff like that, just to hang around with us. But that's an example of like what to do. Or well, I stopped him from training. He's got four weeks left, James, and the way to think about it for me is stop treading through deep water because you're not getting the adaptation required from your session, number one, because you're not training in with the intensity you need. A couple of days off brings you back, can't wait to get going, and before you know it, you're back in the game. This sport is frightened of days off. Athletes are frightened of rest. So how do I manage? Yeah, they are, aren't they? Um, it's like we create mental health issues when we say have a day off. Um, and, and I think it's important that any coach that wants to get into the sport, like objectives are super important if you're doing testing. But I don't think we sweat these subjectives enough at times. They're still human beings, right? They've got a lot of stress in their life. We've got to try and understand it, especially if we're putting things like conditioning in uh, or high load days and this kind of stuff as well. Um, but generally, we score, we'll tick a score. We can pick things up from jump height, obviously, as well. So look at central nervous system drop off, and we do that. The basics of less than, you know, if they're more than 10% out, then maybe we're, we've got to consider what they're doing. Don't really get that issue, if I'm honest. Maybe because we talked to him about fuel. Maybe that Paul Rimmer, very forward-thinking head coach, is actually more on the less is more way of doing things and take some rest. He'll have no issue saying to somebody, right, even in technical training, have a deload week. Tick over footwork drills, light drills, that kind of stuff. Take out a sparring, do touch sparring. Um, that's super important for me. So, But if they fall below, conversation number one. Number two is break down why. Is there something very obvious? Yeah, they had no sleep. Well, there you go. So go and get some sleep and come back the next day, maybe, is a simple conversation. The most common thing I get is they didn't eat their food. They didn't hit their car. And it is. I mean, readiness over training syndrome, whatever you want to call it, is going to be carbohydrate-based most of the time, right? And... Fighters don't like carbohydrate. They think it makes, they think it puts weight on them. So, you know, readiness is important to me. On the app, it comes up, it gives me an insight into every athlete. So I get a trend and I can slot. I can tell you now, I'll pick the days when they go down. I know it's because they've done an extensive uh, technical training session that is, or double or treble 
fits well outside what I've seen in the window because perhaps they've travelled to different gyms, have different sparring partners, um, maybe a different coaches in that day, you know, that doesn't understand. So discussion, understand it, use the subjectives, react, give them some advice, give them a day off. Or actually, you do have a few that maybe are just, just a little bit lazy, so you might push them through the session because you can see there's nothing wrong with them. Nice. Yeah, the, the less is more approach, I think, is slowly permeating into combat sports, but it's a very, very, very slow, <laughs> slow change. Yeah, as you mentioned, the whole blast yourself with random circuits and then, you know, last one to leave, uh, you know, every session has got to be working hard regardless. Is It's still there. It's still there in, in all combat sports. I don't, yeah, it's hard to, to break that. Can, can I reverse a question on you, if I can? Because this yes. is something I'm super passionate about in the development apps aspect of the sport. We've got all that going on still. A decade later, we were trying to talk to people about that. We've still got people doing circuits. Like, think it's only mm -hmm. acceptable if they, they have to collapse to the floor 10 times a session. Not having days off, not mm -hmm. tracking the food, doing the horrendous weight cuts. Like, and I'm in zero strength and conditioning methodology at all i'm even talking about basic principles yet we've got some of the yeah. outstanding academic and research available right so i'd like to think is what can we do that we can develop to something in an educational process that really is explained in a way we, i don't know if you know it we have a ladybird book which is a school kids education book here right it's quite famous for schools Mm -hmm. It's almost we write the we write it on the ladybird book for eight year olds about the do's and don'ts of combat sports because <laughs> we have a lot of really good stuff going on in elite sports, but the kids, how do we make the kids and the juniors and the young amateurs the next best professionals if they don't have access to enough money to pay people? I think that would be my question for me, and that's something I'm so passionate about why we have the madness going on yet we've got so much brilliant resource like like yourself um available to everyone but like how do we do it in a way that people understand it and can apply it you know whether they've got family kids school you know how can they think about things differently because i am astounded on a weekly basis mate of the stuff i see you know um <laughs> Dude, it, it's so tough, man. Like um, with the kids and stuff, like obviously you have TikTok and everything doing everything else. But the, I think that some of the issues as well is you see a lot of the professional fighters, obviously with their potential training vlogs or build-ups to fights through various organizations and you see it. It's in your face. The top guys are doing all the time. And then that it's a trickle-down effect, right? Like how do, you, how do you convince someone you shouldn't do something when they see their favorite fighter doing exactly what they're doing? you know, on TV, on YouTube, whatever it is, and getting around that becomes damn, damn difficult. Yeah, I mean, look, the guys I work alongside, the brilliant academics I work alongside know my stance, which is I know my place in the sport. I'm a coach of people. I'm a coach in performance. I've been doing that a long time. We've got a decent methodology about what we do in s and conditioning. Um, but I want to train kids. I want kids to have access to education. I want them to know what's wrong and right. And and as much as I can travel the world with great athletes and have an incredible team, we talk about the team that Carl and Connor's got. The, the boxing team they've got on, I've got some of the judo guys on as well. Um, and, and that's a good example to use, James. It's GB judo, ready for the, getting ready for Olympics. 23 years of age female, made weight 14 times last year. Made weight 14 times. I have never managed to get any more than a two-week cycle into her program because she's constantly in competition. She does it like, we all know how tough Randori is, right? They do Randori competition, travel the world. Not a single point of education. And when I get into that, I'm kind of, and they come to me, and a lot of them are starting to come to me and get better because all I've taught them is actually less is more. Know how to recover, know how to fuel, and I'm basically giving them a little peaking program constantly to keep, but I'm trying to take more out. I'm trying to make them rest. But my job in the sport before the finish is I'm supposed to sit in front of Sport England and talk about the best way to, for the development pathway of sport, the best way to look after these youngsters, the best way to make them the next pros. And I kind of get concerned about there must be an educational pathway and, and just a, and it's not a, 
I'm not trying to promo it, but and I'd love to bounce it off you, mate, but we're developing something called the Combat Sports Performance Coach Certification. It's for all those that don't get I saw that on Instagram today, right? Yeah, so what we're trying to do is, from the nutrition program, I'm head of, I didn't mention, but I'm head of the Global Performance Nutrition Institute UK, which is the ISSN partner. Uh, so anybody, mm -hmm. and first and foremost, I've got to say while I'm on here, if you've got a chance to go to university, please go, because I'm like, you need to go. But if you don't have, not everybody gets the opportunity. So if you don't, get an education pathway that will still serve you well. Yeah, so, and we've tried to set that up. So mums and dads have even got a nutrition course to make sure they can spot their child as doing the right things. We do a level two, a level three, and a level four in strength and conditioning to, through Active IQ, internationally recognised. But we bolt on that practical days for combat sports performance. So actually, how you should start thinking about combat okay. sports. It's a pathway that goes both ways. And after speaking to Carl and Connor at the university, they see it's a great pathway for somebody coming out of the degree to start getting coaching practice. We do a, we actually do a business um, as well, a business module to teach them how to set up a business, how to, what companies house need from you, how what a bookkeeper looks like, how to do online links. We've got a marketing module. But for those who want to be a coach, we want to bring them out and give them some coaching practice. The other way is that level four can then is is their pathway into to start doing their undergrad as well. So we can kind of cover both bases. Um, we've got around me, you know, some fantastic academics, um, ambassadors from the English MMA. Dan Hardy wants to do the course as a coach and somebody who's been around the sport for a long time. Veronica Hardy is doing an ISSN sports nutrition specialist. One of the GB judo guys has done the. So I wanted to reach out to like parents, athletes, head coaches of gyms maybe. So we kind of have this peers approach everywhere that somebody's got some basic level of education to say, that shit's stupid, stop doing it. These are the basic principles of energy balance and a bit about how you should be training and approach your strength and conditioning and that kind of stuff. So I am kind of excited about it. It's, you know, Vortex is a team of Carl and Connor and Eric and Marcus, all of the academics are kind of uh, involved in that with me. I'm just there to try and develop coaching practice at the moment. You know, I, the guys at strengthandconditioning.com, uh, strengthandconditioningcourse.com, unbelievable guy we work with. He's created the content and that's one of the most popular courses for those who don't get the opportunity. But what we're saying is at the moment, we've got a lot of combat athletes that are coaching strength and conditioning in their own gym to get a living to try and keep in the gym. They're the people making people sick everywhere. Um, so we're trying to, if we can get education better, when it comes to the top and we start using the, the great levels of sports science, above what, what I'm capable of doing, they've already got a great, a great grounding of knowing what combat sport is and all of that. The madness around combat sport and how athlete approaches things and a bit about nutrition that kind of creates a better educational platform maybe. So that's what that is, mate. I'll, as soon as we've, when we finish a couple of weeks, I'd love to send you it, have a look at it. Like, yeah. you're the man for critiquing Definitely. stuff, James, so critique it for me, mate, because I'm happy to take it, <laughs> you know? <laughs> I, I, I get critiqued on the videos that I critique. Oh, really? Uh, so yeah. that's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's, gone, it's gone full circle. I get a bunch of negative comments all the time. It's quite funny. But yeah, no, I'd, love to, I'd love to take a look at it. And uh, leave us, let me know as well, because I, uh, I can send it out through email and post about it and stuff too. Uh, just to get those it, it's get look, the word out. I think I've got three years left. I'd like to leave something that I thought could make a difference, which stops a kid from doing a stupid mm -hmm. weight cut or sitting a 14 or sitting in a bath all night doing a dehydration. Because that's that happens. Dude. Or stop you know, so yeah. This is the basis I guess I get into and, and I know generally you're trying to talk to me about strength and condition methodology and I'm you know, I've tried to explain what we do with the thing. Can we have a lot of success? The outcome for the athletes seems to be really uh, positive right now. We're a hell of a winning record for all our athletes. But I think everything we do in education and research has to have an outcome. Um, and sometimes I think we lose that outcome of where it goes into and how does it change behavior. Ah, perfect, perfect. Yeah, let me know when that comes out and I can, I can send it out. But where can people find you, Paul, and keep up to date with everything you're doing? Okay, so personal... Uh, Instagram page is at Rigor, which was actually my Mercedes-Benz business, at Rigor Paul. 
Um, <laughs> I was wondering why that, I, why that was the name. I can't get rid of the. I, I can't get rid of the profile. I mean, if you get your blue tick, and over time, mate, I've been that business for fifteen years. It's what everybody knows me as, right? So it's kind of like it's going to stay, I guess. Um, <laughs> we have Vortex CSP. If you want to check that out as well, let's see. We don't do. We're not a big marketing business. If I'm honest, change we're full up with clients and stuff but like check out vortex csp i'm going to do more work with that i'm pushing carl and connor to share more of their brilliant work because they there's they're so good at what they do and and maybe they're a bit quiet about it right so um vortex csp um gpni uk is the global performance nutrition institute insta which is quite fresh and new right now but we've had a good sign up for that where we're trying to uh, create that basic i mean it goes all the way up to what issn call their master cissn but like you've got an educational pathway with real basics that parents can do all the way to athletes, to coaches, to personal trainers, to certain conditioning coaches all the way. Uh, they're, they're kind of the three main sites, really. I'm, I, I've got to say, I'm a collaborator. I love working with people. You'll never see me post anything negative. Um, I work with a lot of great people in the sport. I listen to people. And as I keep saying, I'm a student of the sport at 56. I still love it. I'm passionate about it. I hope that comes across as well. Oh, perfect. Love that. Love that. And I'll link all those in the description as well so people can go and and follow you and follow everything you're doing. But Paul, thanks for coming on and sharing everything and, and sharing your years of knowledge too. Thank you, mate. It's uh, It's been a pleasure. I appreciate you asking me on. I really do.